We are in the book of Galatians this morning, and um, we're going to, if you haven't picked up on a theme, (laughs) um, the theme um, is running through um, this book and our uh, passage this morning. Kind of flows with last week a little bit uh, from Timothy. Um, this training um, in, in Christ's righteousness, this equipping, that's what Paul is doing. In Galatians, Paul is a teacher, and, um, and so he's going to teach us today, and, and hopefully as we work through this, um, we'll be able to jump into the middle um, of, of this um, as, as we go. So it's from Galatians chapter 3, uh, verses 22 through 20. Nine, But the writing, the law, imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian, our school teacher, our disciplinarian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, if we are Christ, then we are Abraham's offspring And we are children, heirs, according to promise. There's that word promise again. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the infallible word of God, it stands uh, forever. You can go back to the first of um, the slides of Scripture. Paul is doing something here. I'm going to try to uh, set this up because this is really a lot of uh, theology and um, a lot of teaching. Um, but there, there's a big picture uh, that he's doing here, and I hope we can do it. But the Galatians, Paul had planted this church in uh, Galatians, and, and now Paul had left, and now he's writing this letter to this church. And, and Paul says, and he says something interesting within the book before we get, get here, but um, they, they began well under Paul, but something happened. Something happened along the way, and teachers came into the church and started to divide them. Um, there was division. Um, there was um, there was another gospel. Uh, there was uh, things being added. Jesus' name was being um, maligned in the midst of it. At the same time, um, the false teachers were acting like they were promoting Jesus' name. And Paul says something very interesting in Galatians. So these people were, were redeemed. They were called out. They came to know Christ and their, 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 their lifestyles before um, they came to know Christ would have been considered uh, pretty licentious, um, pretty worldly in, in those manners. And, and so Paul has come and he says something very interesting After he's writing to them about these false teachers, he actually says to these people, this group of believers, you have fallen from grace. Those are Paul's words. You have fallen from grace. Now, we know those words in our language. We know those words in our vernacular. And when you hear that someone has fallen from grace, what do you immediately think? You immediately think, well, they must have done something pretty bad. Um, you know, if, if, um, if, if, if that were said about me and you heard around uh, the Nature Coast community um, uh, that Brad had fallen from grace, you would immediately be thinking, oh my, what did he do? It's just another week. <laughs> exactly. 
It's another week at Nature Coast. Because you probably have heard that in this community. But anyway, that's a sidebar. Um, you've fallen from grace. Paul uses that term, but he wouldn't use it in the same way that we would use it. He is telling this group of people, they have fallen from grace. And you know what this church has done? They've added more rules. They haven't lived like the devil. They haven't lived like anything else. They literally, this is how we've abused the term grace, they've literally fallen away from grace because they've added to grace. And when you add to grace, you fall away from grace. This is the impetus of this book, and this is what they're doing. And so in this particular book, they've added and fallen away from grace because there were Jews that were redeemed, and there were Gentiles that were redeemed, and, and the Jews wanted to make the Gentiles um, be circumcised. And so they were saying, well, no, if you, if you love Jesus a lot, you also got to get circumcised. You know, if you love Jesus um, a lot. Um, you have to do this and you have to do that. You, you can't eat bacon anymore if you're a Gentile, if you really love Jesus. And Paul is saying that those rules, those additions to this glorious good news of the finished work of Christ is how we fall from grace. Because the minute we add anything to Jesus plus nothing, we have fallen from grace. Remember a few weeks ago I said Jesus plus something, especially in the vernacular of Scripture, is always adultery. It's always pursuing another lover, something else that um, can save us, something else that we choose to pursue other than him. But Jesus, anything other than Jesus plus nothing equals everything, is a falling from grace. And so that is where we are. And here's how it shows up. I mean, it showed up even in Galatians. They didn't discount Jesus. In fact, they would say Jesus has done a lot. In fact, Jesus has done the most. <laughs> Jesus has done the most. Jesus has done the most, but still here are a few things that you still need to do. Paul says, uh-uh, uh-uh. So the whole goal of this book, as we're going to get to here in a second, is to demolish the idea that the law can do anything to change you. It's to obliterate that idea, which then makes its goal freedom which then makes its goal love. That's the whole book of Galatians. Obliterate the idea that the law could ever bring you to change or do anything that would make you even the least most lovable or acceptable to God. And in doing that, set you free. And in being set free, faith, Galatians will say in the book of, in chapter 5, faith, this faith, works itself out through love. That's the whole book of Galatians, an obliteration that sets us free to love and be one in Christ. It's what's going on in this passage, but this writing, and Paul says some interesting things here, which actually follow up with what I said uh, last week about we do have to really think because we have been so trained in a righteousness that comes from a law that this feels awkward it feels scandalous it feels different to us and even Paul's words may feel like that to us this morning and that's okay because Paul is training us and equipping us in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and to the finished work of Jesus Christ and he's rebuking He's rebuking and correcting anything that doesn't train us in that righteousness. And that's what he does here. So he talks about this, this law. And in the Old Testament, the law was the first five books of the Bible. It encompassed far more than the Ten Commandments. It's certainly in the Old Testament, if you were under the Jewish law, you needed to be circumcised. You couldn't eat certain foods, as was going on. Um, uh, and, and here, the, the part of the argument um, was over. But Paul's actually saying something 
about that whole way of doing things, he uses interesting words, but the writing, the law, imprisons us. It, it puts us in prison. It's like the law's this rigged system. You know, it's rigged against us. I was reading this week, and someone says, the law will make you mad, and then it will make you sad. It will make you mad because it is relentless in its requirement for perfection. It is relentless in what it demands of you, and then it will make you sad because we'll see that we don't measure up to it, and then it will have done its purpose because then faith will come in the midst of all of that. But it's this rigged system. You look at the words Paul uses. He imprisons us under sin so that the promise, so there's something about law and promise that are, are connected so that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before, before faith came, look at the language again. We were held captive under the law, imprisoned again until the coming of faith. I don't really need to do a lot to prove this point. All I have to say is, did you wake up this morning? <laughs> And what did you do when you woke up this morning? I mean, we already went through some of us, what am I going to wear today? What will people think about what I wear today? Yeah, that's funny too, isn't it? Someone said if I was warm yet because I have this hoodie on this morning. I'm always cold. And this is a very lightweight hoodie, so. Um, <laughs> but we, <laughs> yeah, we come and we ask that question. And you know why we ask the question, what do I wear today? Most of us ask the question, what do I wear today? Because we may be going somewhere. And there will be a group of people there. And will I be, be addressed? Will someone think I'm dressed appropriately for that occasion? Even if it's Walmart or even if it's the grocery store. It's the doctor's office. or It's anywhere you go. You're, you're doing it. And there's, there's something at work in you that is actually working within you to make a choice about what you're even, even wearing today. And it can become burdensome. burdensome. It maybe was burdensome um, to some this morning. I actually thought that if I put this on, someone's going to say something about it being 90 degrees outside. But I didn't care. <laughs> the other big question you woke up this morning with, some of you maybe ended up here. Some of you, uh, some of people maybe didn't end up here. But how am I going to spend my time? How am I going to spend my time today? And whatever grid that you work through today about how you're going to spend your time, there's a law at work in the midst of that. Am I going to read my Bible for 15 minutes today? Am I going to pray? Am I going to go home and watch some baseball this afternoon? And is that a good use of my time? I mean, you're beginning to see how we just woke up and this law, this rigged system is screaming at us. It in every decision we make. What will I wear? How will I spend my time? Will I go to church today? Well, I won't go to church today. Well, what if I go to church today, but my kid doesn't want me to go to church because they want me to spend time with me? There is a law working, but the Bible says that I should spend time with my kids. Should I go to church? Should I spend time with my kids? Should I wear this or should I not wear this? Uh, you know, and then there are people who actually, you come into church and someone actually probably sits there and criticizes you for what you are wearing because there is a law at work. And it is all in our minds, and it is relentless, and it is rigged, and we are enslaved to it. We are enslaved to what we can't even make a decision about what we are doing today or what we were wearing without wondering what someone else would think. Let alone what God would think. Because doesn't he care how I spend my time today? Am I really loving God if I sit down and watch a baseball game? I mean, you, you can just see. You see it going. That slavery, that imprisonment. We wake up every day, and if we're really, really honest, every day we wake up attempting to appease our conscience in some way. Am I enough? We're always evaluating. We're always criticizing. I'm not what I should be. Who hasn't thought that? 
because the law is coming, and it not only call, uh, uh, causes us, here's what we really believe, and we, we actually teach this in the church, that God, this is the law, this is the law that we're in prison to, that we actually maybe came to church this morning, or maybe you come to church regularly because you bought into this rigged system that actually believes that God will love a future version of me better than the version now. That becomes the impetus for almost the whole of Christianity, at least in Western civilization, that we actually come because God will love a future version of me more than he loves the current version of me. And we are enslaved to that, and that is why we get into despair. It's also why we end up tearing each other apart is because we are in this law, and if I'm not enough, you're not going to be enough either, and maybe I need to prove that I'm enough to prove that you're not enough. And so if I can prove that you're not enough, then I'm enough. Do you see the slavery that just rips us? Because the law is relentless in what it demands and what it asks of us. You know, this time, I'll never do that again. <laughs> this time, I really meant it. And then there are things that we all have done that we wish we'd never have done. And there are things that we've done in relationships or we've done in our lives and it seems like we've apologized a thousand times for them. Um, we've, we've done our penance a thousand t times. We're not, we haven't even just uh, apologized a, a thousand times. Um, you know, we, we do a thousand good deeds for that one bad deed that we did, hoping that it could be undone. But you know what we find out? Even if we've done something wrong and, and something evil, and, and maybe it's broken a relationship we've had with another person, that something else has to come in because we can, we can, we can do a thousand good deeds for the one bad deed. We could do a thousand apologies for the one bad deed, and yet you still did the bad deed, and it's not going away. And our only hope is that forgiveness comes. But you know what the law does? The law takes us into the church of Christ. We actually hear that we have the forgiveness of sins. And we hear that freely proclaimed to set us free. And you know what the law says? <sighs> You've asked for forgiveness. And the law says, I'm not going to forgive you because the law can't forgive your sin. It can't. You talk about torture. Seeking forgiveness. Offering forgiveness. Wanting forgiveness putting you through. It's like a cruel thing. It puts you through that, and then it says there's no forgiveness. The law is relentless. You know, we live in a world that never forgives. Whether I as a minister and whatever my week may bring or whatever we do, there are certain realities Just turn on the TV. There are certain things that nobody will ever give you forgiveness for. Because the law is relentless. It's what it does. And so we try and we try and we try. We become addicted. You know, all of our addictions are some form of, of law. You know, maybe I want to watch a baseball game today because I just want to shut out the law in my mind and so I will watch it and I will watch more but it is relentless and we hope to find deliverance just give me some deliverance maybe if my team wins I'll feel better that never happens because I'm a Bengals fan <laughs> anyway <laughs> that's the law right there screaming at me comes at us and we are always trusting something that can't deliver us and yet the promise is there I will deliver you 
I will deliver you. I will deliver you. If I just have an hour of quiet time, I will be delivered from my feelings. If I, I just um, um, pray more, I will be delivered from my feelings. And, and all of these things are coming at us, offering deliverance and offering us rest. And Paul says we are imprisoned and we are held captive to them. But then in 24 through 26, it says that Christ came. Something intervened. Something came to break us free from this prison. And listen to this. You can do this. Beginning in verse 23, wouldn't even be a bad thing to do in your Bibles at home. Every time you see the word faith from 23 to 29, Substitute the word Jesus. Let me read it that way. Now before Jesus came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming of Jesus would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Jesus came, it's used there, in order that we may be justified by Jesus. But now that Jesus has come, we are no longer under a guardian. You can go to the next slide. For in Christ Jesus, we are all sons of God through Jesus Christ. For as many as of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is male nor female, for you are all alone in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Something came and intervened into that imprisonment and into that captivity, and it is used synonymously with the word faith because faith is a person. Faith is, in fact, in 22, if you actually go to the literal meaning of it, which I actually put the literal meaning of it, which is the first verse. So most of versions say, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. It actually doesn't say that in the real Greek translation, it says, by the faith of, it's Jesus' Christ's faith. It's his faith. It's his faith that's been given to those who believe. And in our imprisonment and in our captivity, he has come and he has done something. And what he has done is to set us free from that tyranny, to set us free from all of those things. When Jesus came, we are now no longer imprisoned by the divine accountant who is checking our debits and who is checking our credits. When Jesus came, we are no longer governed by an accountant. But by Jesus, and you know in Luke 4, when Jesus is starting his ministry, what does he do? He actually is in a synagogue one Sunday. He's just beginning to start his ministry. They need someone to read scripture. He stands up and he reads scripture. And he actually reads from the book of Isaiah in Luke chapter 4. And you know what Jesus' first words as they were coming out in Luke were? He, he, he quotes Isaiah and says that there is one who is coming that's going to set at liberty and set the captives free and he sits down and he says today this was fulfilled in your hearing because it's what Jesus even said he was going to come to do it was to set us free you go to this this second slide I think it's the second slide here right so how do we what do we do? How do we know? You know what the great thing Paul does is he actually brings a tangible expression to help us remember this fact because the Galatians were going back and they were imprisoning. They had been set free. They'd been set free, but their lack of love and unity was evidence that they had head back. Anytime there's lack of love and unity, there's always imprisonment. It means you haven't been set free. It means that, that all of those things are, are still at work in you. And So they'd been set free, but now they're returning back to these ways of captivity and he's saying I need to I need something I need something to remind you as I'm writing something to remind you and what does he do he actually brings pulls out a tangible thing and he actually brings out our baptism for he says this for as many for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith 
There's identity. Identity is everywhere. For as many as you, as you, of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Here is your tangible reminder. Your baptism. Your baptism reminds you that you have put on Christ. Your baptism reminds you that you haven't put on the law. Your baptism reminds you you have put on the one who has come and fulfilled the law. Your baptism reminds you that if you have put on Christ, you have put on his life, you have put on his death, you have put on his resurrection, you have put on his ascension, and you have put on his spirit, which he poured out at Pentecost. All of it's yours, and so that's why when we baptize, what do we baptize in? We baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because it reminds us that that is our name. That is the name that we have been given and that is the name in the waters of baptism that we are now under the name of Christ Paul wants to free our conscience and what does he do he points us to the meaning and the reality of our baptism. Martin Luther was famous for this. The, he'd always yell at the devil. It felt like the devil was coming into him. He'd come into his little office that he was studying. He'd throw ink bottles at the devil, and he would do all kinds of things at the devil. But as he was throwing the ink bottle, he would always say to this to the devil, I am a baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. I am baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That is is who I am. He wants our conscience free. And then he takes worldly distinctions and he says, in Jesus, in this baptism, they're all mute. They're one. There's neither Jew nor Greek. These are worldly distinctions, slave or free. There's no male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. All of the distinctions under Jesus and under the cross are gone. We're all the same. It's why we're called to be one. It's why our baptism, in Paul will say in Corinthians, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Because we're all one in Jesus. And if we're all one in Jesus, then all of those things that rip us apart, all of those things that tear us apart, all of those laws that we have set up for each other, all of those laws, I mean, in any broken human relationship, those broken human relationships are there is because we've actually set up a criteria and a law that the other person has failed. And Jesus is saying that in Christ we are all the same. We are all equal under the cross. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And we don't have to ask the question, how do you, are, how do you rank? How do I compare with you? How do I rank in my spirituality? I mean, we're always climbing that ladder, which I talked about um, last week. Our freedom and our peace from the law, our freedom from the imprisonment from the law comes from Jesus alone. It's faith and trust in him to deliver us. Trust in his work. Trust in his cross. Trust in his resurrection. Trust in his life. Trust in his obedience. Somewhere along the line in the Christian life, we became more interested in our strengths. You know, the devil tends to operate in our strengths. You know what Christ wants? He wants our weakness because his power is made perfect in our weakness. It's what he does. And what Paul is saying, Martin Luther said in his great hymn, is he's trying He's trying to remind us that we are free and we are not imprisoned with that tyranny of, did I do this right? Did I not do this right? This tyranny of, of some performance that you're not meeting, some behavior that you're supposed to be doing or not be doing. And his great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, Luther is offering that peace and what Paul is saying to you and I that in our baptism, the right man is on our side and he is the man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be. Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabbath, Lord rest is his name. Age to age, the same and he has won the battle. Luther's greatest work is his commentary on Galatians. 
If you ever want to read anything other than the Bible and you have the stomach for heady stuff, <laughs> read that. You know what, though? We struggle. You know, we read Galatians. We think, well, we don't have oh, that circumcision issue anymore. Some of us have already had bacon for breakfast. Um, you know, we, we don't have all of these um, things going on, but we still have our own sin management system. We have our modern day circumcisions, and I've mentioned them, you know, Bible reading, prayer, church attendance. And you know what we say as good evangelicals? We will always say this, you know, a Bible reading and prayer and church attendance. No, they don't save us. No one in their right evangelical mind would say that they save us. But here's what we say. They become the safe place where we can find our assurance that we're Jesus. This whole enterprise in Galatians and even in the church at large today is just completely narcissistic. Because at every turn, you're turned in on yourself. Every turn. And what we end up saying is, instead of Jesus being my rest, instead of Jesus being my hope, my rest is in my obedience. I will tell you this, if your rest is in your obedience, then your rest is under the law, and if your rest is in your obedience, then you are a slave that will never find rest. Because I just want to ask how you're doing this week then. How are you doing? If your obedience is your rest. If your obedience is your assurance. And I, this is what Paul's coming at in Galatians. He's pushing us back to the one whose name was Jesus. Because Jesus is our obedience. One thing Paul realizes in Galatians is that freedom is scary. It is scary. Some may be uncomfortable with all the things I just said because you're scared. You're fearful. You know what freedom is in Jesus? It's the realization that there is nothing more that you can earn, period. Freedom is, it is finished. And yet somehow we have this Jesus hanging on the cross. He's bloodied. He's been separated from God. And we're saying that was not enough. That's blasphemy. That's what Paul's saying. Jesus has come and yet freedom scares us. Do you know what being a Christian means? It means embracing the reality that God has done it all, period. Anything else is an addition to his work, a mockery of his cross. You see, grace, it takes daringness to believe that, that God's done it all. And trust that he has. Grace is our prison break. <laughs> because Jesus is grace. John Wesley, who probably struggled with some of this, wrote that great hymn, And Can It Be? He said this, My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. And Paul says the only way that you will ever work yourself toward loving others is to actually believe that you have nothing left to do. And the minute you believe you have something left to do, all of your attention will be focused on yourselves and you have no ability to love anybody else because you're in the tyranny of whether you've done it enough, whether you've raised your kid right enough. There's a great law that we live under, the, the tyranny of parenting. Christianity... In a way, it's not a mission. It's not a sin management program. It's a surprise party. 
believing that God is, for by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, that what? That he has prepared beforehand for us to walk in. You know what we get to do as Christians? We just get to live, and we will walk by his spirit, and whatever good he has prepared beforehand to do, we don't have to create it. He's given it to us. Our freedom does not come from the next rung on the ladder. Our freedom comes from the priceless gift of grace. That's where it's come from. And that is why there is no greater assault on the church of Jesus Christ today than an assault upon grace because the devil knows that it is in grace that we're free. And the devil and religious relentless assault on grace is relentless and it's full of the law. Listen I don't know if this was a great sermon or not. I don't know if I perfectly followed what God shared in his word. I, I shared the passage. I, I did what I was going to do. I prepped and I did whatever I did. But the voice in my head that says, Brad, what if you screwed up the text is an imprisoning voice. All I know is that this morning I got up and I was free in Christ and I will trust his spirit to do with his word what he promised he would do. And it sets me free every single day time so you can come and you can naysay and you can scream and you can yell and all you are is the law screaming at me that I'm not enough you know what you're gonna have to do if I'm wrong you're gonna have to trust the Holy Spirit of God to change me I've said that to people I don't know maybe I'm right maybe I'm wrong your yelling and screaming isn't going to change me, but I would really appreciate your prayers because there is something in your prayer that could change my inerrant thinking, but only that can do it. And God has done that over the years, and I'm free in Christ. And yes, freedom is scary because it's really scary and beautiful to throw yourself onto the finished work of a crucified, risen Christ and trust what he says, that he has you, to trust as represented in your baptism that the right man is on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dusk ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is is he the lord of rest is his name and from age to age he's the same jesus plus nothing is everything we're going to close and uh, the journeymen are going to come and lead us in song and remind us of the freedom that um we have in Christ, the freedom that we sing about, the freedom that it goes um, through, throughout the earth. So let's pray as they, they come. Father, we thank you that you've given us Jesus. We thank you that you've given us his spirit, and then you've given us the spirit to produce fruit. We ask that you work in our hearts and our lives to do just that. In Christ's name, amen. You know, Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. You know what it says? We always miss at the end of that. It says at the end of the list of the fruits of the Spirit, it says, against such there is no law because the law can't produce love. The law can't produce peace. The law can't produce gentleness. But the Spirit, because of Jesus and his finished work, can. And that is his fruit that bears fruit in our life. Let's stand and sing. Amen. Amen. Lord, reign in me. Let his spirit reign in us.